Welcome to our first session on systemic risk, financial stability, and uh, uh, Dodd Frank resolution plan. I'm delighted to be the moderator for this uh, session. I'm going to give you a very brief uh, background. Uh, the, the goal of the financial reform, as you've heard uh, from Dr. Plosser, uh, is to promote financial stability uh, by uh, reducing the probability of CFI failure and also allowing fail, failing CFI to be resolved with minimum disruption. And so these topics of sy systemic risk and resolution plan is a big part of the uh, financial reform and uh, it is the focus of this session. While much progress has been made, there are still, uh, some, we are still mindful about some practical considerations. As you have heard uh, from Dr. Plaza, one is related to the complexity of the measuring and managing systemic risk. And also we need to uh, balance regulation and maintaining competitiveness in the global market. So given the dynamic major, uh, nature of this challenge, we believe that uh, ongoing dialogue and debate across the public, academic and private sectors would be of great benefit. And so to that end, we have assembled a remarkable panel for this afternoon. To my left, the first speaker is Ali Reza Tabaz Salehi. Ali Reza is a finance professor at Columbia Business School. As a PhD in electrical engineering, he has applied the network effect framework to a study of financial system. He will be sharing with us his research on how the, the structure of financial network would impact the fragility of the financial system as a whole. So uh, turn uh, the microphone to Thank Ali Reza. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so how do I get my slides? Do I... Oh. Uh, okay. Just click, oh, on click on my name. Well, there, uh, there is a no. Oh, okay, I see it here. There we go. Oh, perfect. Okay, and I can go. Okay, perfect. Um, so thank you so much for the invitation and for the for the kind introduction. I'm told not to move around a lot, but uh, so I'll try my best. Uh, this is a joint work with uh, Daron Ashimoglu and also as Daglar at, uh, at MIT and as Jolapa said, I'm at the Columbia Business School. So I'm not going to spend too much time on the, on the motivation. Also, I'm going to have a short time and I'm sure this is an audience that does not uh, need motivation. Uh, for this study, but uh, we were motivated by obviously by a lot of other papers, uh, similar to the lot of other papers by uh, the recent financial crisis. After the crisis, there has been a lot of talk about uh, firms that are not necessarily too big to fail, but too interconnected to fail, and whether there is any any anything one one can say about the role of network effects or domino effects, things that were sort of loosely defined and, and applied. So we're motivated by that uh, by that story, of course. We were not the first people who started thinking about it. In fact, it has a long history going back to a paper by Franklin and, uh, and his co-author and, you know, uh, and another paper by Frege, Parigi and Rocher. So it go, it's, and you can see these are relatively old papers by now. They are, they're a common hypothesis that come out of uh, these papers. These papers essentially make, were making an argument that an interbank, interbank connections can serve as a, as, a, as a mechanism for the stability of the system. So here I have uh, two network structures. I've, uh, these are like just uh, simple toy examples in which here on the network on the left, you would see what we call a ring structure. Here is bank, one bank lending to the bank on the right. Uh, each bank has essentially in, uh, a lending relationship with only two other banks. Here is a much more complicated and complex structure in which many more banks have uh, uh, lending relationships with one another. So the, the hypothesis that comes out of the Allen and Gale and Frege, Pergé and Rocher and similar studies was that the, these more densely connected network structures are essentially much more stable than these sparsely connected networks. And the intuition behind the results is also fairly simple and straightforward. The intuition is that, well, if, if here this is essentially a perfect domino, if this bank is hit with some negative shock, the losses are going to be transferred to this second bank, and the losses are going to be all transferred to this third bank, so you would get a perfect domino uh, here. Whereas here, this network structure, any shock that is hit with the bank, the losses are going to be divided among many more uh, counterparties, and if these banks have any, have any excess liquidity, they would be able to absorb uh, 
the shock. Essentially, the excess liquidity of these bags would function as, uh, as a cushion that would absorb the shocks. On the other hand, there was a different type of literature arguing the exact opposite of, of these results. These literature mostly came out of, there were some economics, papers, economics and finance paper, but some of them also were coming from uh, the computer science literature. And their argument was that essentially uh, contagion of financial risk is like epidemics. If you, if you have a problem at some bank, interconnectivity is exactly what's going to hurt you. At that moment, you want to, in fact, isolate the distressed banks from the rest of the banking system, making sure that you're protecting from them. And then there is a second, uh, so this is in, in stark contrast with the Allen and Gale story that, that I just mentioned. In con and finally, there is another paper that actually did uh, you know, do some shameless self-promotion coming uh, with, uh, again, we did in the context of input output economies. These are economies with uh, linear, uh, log linear relationship. In that, in that context, it turns out that the sparsity or the extent of connectivity is not relevant. Rather, what matters for stability of the system is the extent of symmetry or asymmetry in the network structure. So what we do in this paper, we come up with a toy, with a very simple minimalist Mickey Mouse model to essentially reconcile these different uh, points of view. So as I said, this is going to be a simple model of interbank lending and counterparty risk. The results of the paper essentially we show that the form of interactions and the magnitude of the shocks that hit, hit the banks are of first order importance. Those are exactly what's going, what are going to define uh, the extent of uh, stability or fragility of the system. And this is the, essentially the result that we get, uh, that we show that if the shocks are small, essentially the Allen and Gill story prevailed. When, with, very, with shocks that are smaller than a, uh, than a certain size, sparsity implies fragility. However, as soon as the size of a shock passes a certain threshold, there is a dramatic regime change or phase transition. The, more, the, the networks that were most, the most stable under the small shock regime become exactly the least stable under this large shock regime. So essentially, this paper is, is essentially about the size of the shocks and the effect that I have in interaction with the structure of the network. And then we have some results on the formation of uh, networks in equilibrium when banks decide endogenously to, re to lend to one another and, the, and at what interest rates. I don't expect to have time about uh, this to talk today, but uh, I would be happy to, uh, to talk about that. Offline. And uh, just as one last slide be before I get to the model, essentially that this results that we have formalizes an, a conjecture by Andy Haldane, who is the executive director of financial stability at the Bank of England. Haldane's conjecture is that essentially this is from his speech, uh, this quote's from his speech. He essentially is of the view that financial, the financial system has a robust yet fragile property. This essentially saying that the same features that make the financial system highly stable under certain conditions can, can, can be the source of fragility under a different set of conditions. He essentially says that beyond a certain range, let's say as the, in our model, as the size of a shock passes a certain threshold, the system flips to the wrong side of the knife. So essentially, that's, that's, that's going to be our story as well. So as I said, there is a long literature that, uh, that uh, looks at financial networks. In fact, there are the similar uh, network papers that look at the similar effects, but in the context of the real economy. But let me skip these and get to the model. So this is going to be a Mickey Mouse model of uh, financial networks. We have N risk neutral financial institutions, which for simplicity, I'm just going to call them banks. It's a standard three period model. Each bank has an initial capital K. At t equal to zero, banks lend to one another and write standard debt contracts in exchange. So at these debt contracts have to be repaid at t equal to one. I'm going to write as yij to be the face value of j's commitment to bank i. And these interbank commitments define a financial network at t equal to one. So here is a pretty picture or relatively pretty picture to show that here bank j is, is uh, has to pay back bank, uh, bank I, and YIJ is the is the face value of that contract. So for now, I'm gonna we're gonna take the interbank commitments as given. So in this talk, I won't be able to talk about what happens at equal to zero, but at equal to one, we have these interbank <coughs> relationships formed. Um, so after the borrowing happens at equal to at equal to zero, bank I invests in a project which has short-term and long-term returns. The, the return at t equal to 1 is, we're going to show it by zi. This is a random return. You can consider this as the shock to bank i. And then there is a deterministic return of capital A at t equal to 2. This is, uh, this is going to be deterministic if the project is not liquidated prematurely. And uh, so banks have two types of obligations. 
One is the interbank commitments that I said. So these are these YIJs that I already mentioned. We're going to assume that banks have have a second type of commitment, which for you know for modern purposes, we're going to assume that these are more senior. These are some senior auto obligations of value V. It um, and as I as I go ahead and show the results, you'll see why why we need this assumption. So if a bank cannot meet its obligations, it has to liquidate its long-term project. So essentially, the bank defaults, it liquidates its prima, uh, uh, project prematurely, and recovers zeta or kc times whatever this is, zeta times a of the, uh, of the proceeds. So essentially, the liquidation is costly. This zeta number is a number strictly less than one. And it has to pay back its junior creditors, these other banks, on a pro rata basis, proportional to the face value of the contract. Okay, so just as to summarize the model, at t equal to zero, banks lend to one another and invest in projects. At t equal to one, the short-term returns are realized, and banks have to meet these interbank obligations and those, those outside obligations. And if there is any shortfall, leads to liquidation and even default potentially. And at t equal to two, the banks that are, have not defaulted, they essentially consume uh, the long-term returns. Okay, so now let's look at a t equal to one. And, and so, and um, I apologize, this is going to be a little notation heavy, this slide, but at t equal to one, let me show by zj the short term return. cj is potentially how much cash bank has hoarded at, at, from the previous period. Let me show by yij the total commitment of bank j to all other <coughs> banks. lj is how much the bank gets out of liquidation. And v, remember, were these outside, more senior outside obligations. So here, xij is how much is the commitment, how much bank J ends up paying bank I. Bank J ends up paying bank I exactly equal to the face value of the, uh, of the contract if the bank is solvent. It's as if essentially the cash plus the short-term returns plus what it gets from liquidation and how much all other banks pay it is going to be bigger than its total obligation. So if the bank is solvent, it pays equal to the face value of the contract. On the other hand, the, on the bottom line, if the total assets, uh, total resources available to the bank is less than the face value of the senior debt, then the bank does not, then the junior creditors don't get anything. And if this falls anywhere between this V and V plus YJ, then the bank pays them proportional to the face value of the contract on the pro rata basis. Okay, so that determines the interbank payments. As you can see, this XIJ's interbank payment depends on how much all other banks are paying bank J. And of course, one other thing that I had to mention, that these LJs, which are the liquidation amounts, these are also endogenous variables because banks decide how much to, to liquidate. So as, at the end of the day, what we're going to define is going to be a payment equilibrium. These are cons mutually consistent interbank payments and liquidation decisions defined in this way, essentially. So here, let me define a matrix Q, which is the, the, proportion, the proportion of bank J's commitments to bank I. I'm going to fill, fill up this matrix with these uh, proportional commitments. And the total payment, the vector of out payments, is going to be equal to the face value of the contract for the bank that is solvent. Otherwise, it's going to pay, it's going to pay out whatever resources it has available. On the other hand, the liquidation depends, is going to be equal to zeta times A, which is the maximum it can liquidate, or, or the shortfall of the bank. So essentially, you pay the shortfall unless you cannot meet all the shortfall, then you liquidate everything. So our solution concept essentially is what we call a payment equilibrium, is a fixed point of x and l, vector x and vector l, which uh, meet, solve this, uh, this set of uh, fixed point equations. Okay, and the first result which one can show is that a payment equilibrium is, exists and is generically unique. So these objects x and l are essentially well defined. Okay, so for, for the rest of the talk, essentially I'm going to talk about the properties of this x and l. Okay, so to make matters even simpler, we're going to, I'm going to only focus on regular financial networks. And by regular, I'm just going to normalize the, out, the total commitments of all banks to be the same for, uh, across the network. So essentially, I'm shutting down size, making sure that all banks are our equal sizes. All banks have invested in similar projects, and there is no asymmetry in banks' commitments to one another. Okay, so any, any effect that you would see comes only from the, the, the network structure. I'm going to assume that this zeta is zero, so essentially you don't get anything from liquidation. And the short-term returns can only take two values. It's either A, which is you can think of it as a business as usual regime, or A minus epsilon, where epsilon is the size of the neg negative chalk. And I'm going to assume that banks have not hoarded any cash from the previous period. These are all essentially just normalizations. 
So the first lemma, which is uh, very simple to show, is that this, the, the social surplus in the economy is going to be decreasing in the number of defaults. Because remember, the, social, the real economic value is going to be destroyed whenever these long-term projects are being uh, liquidated. So essentially, as a, no, as a notion of fragility, to measure fragility, I can simply count the number of defaults in this model, and that's going to capture, uh, that's going to ca uh, capture the, the social surplus in the economy, the performance of the system. And I'm going to use two notions, resilience and stability. Stability is going to be the expected number of defaults at the face of uh, one shock, whereas resilience is essentially a worst case performance. If these shocks hit, uh, hit, if I want to put them strategically in a place that's going to cr uh, create the maximum number of defaults. Okay, so these are going to be my notions. So here is the first result. Uh, so remember, epsilon was the size of the shock, and y was the bank's commitment. It says that if there exist numbers epsilon star and y star, such that if the size of the shock is below epsilon star, is below that threshold, and y is bigger than y star, so it means that there is enough connectivity between the banks, then the complete financial network structure is the most stable and resilient among all possible network structure. So this comes here, this one, what we call the complete, is one extreme among all possible network structures. And the ring financial network is the least stable. This, this goes all the way to the other extreme. So these two, these two that were studied but in the Allen and Gale paper essentially define the two, uh, to two, the two extreme points among all possible network structures. And the intuition behind this result is, again, similar, is identical, in fact, to the Allen and Gill story in the sense that any losses to a bank here is going to be divided equally among all these counterparties. And because each bank has access to some cushion, the banks would be able to absorb that. Whereas here, this defines a perfect domino. And one can generalize this result saying that, you know, one can define a continuous path coming from uh, this ring network structure to the complete network structure, and you can see that as you move continuously from this structure to this structure, the system gets just simply more stable and more resilient. And uh, there are other results, but I can skip, I can skip uh, these. So here is essentially the gist of the first set of results. For epsilon less than that threshold epsilon star, sparsity means fragility, whereas interconnectivity means resilience. As I said, this is similar to the Allen and Gale and Freja, Parigin, and Rocher results. I uh, talked about the intuition. And it's also in contrast with the, uh, with the other paper I mentioned in terms of linear or log linear relationships. And the contrast is because, that, because in, in input-output economies, like the long M plus R type of economies, where the, the main assumption is that the interactions between different firms are linear. When you have linear relationships, positive shock somewhere in the system can cancel negative, can wash out negative shock somewhere else. However, when you have nonlinearities, which obviously you have in, in case of debt contracts, it's only the negative shocks that propagate through the system. If I get a positive shock and, uh, and I know it tied $10, I just pay him $10, no matter how good my shock was. But it's only the negative sh shocks that propagate. So this nonlinearity that exists in the debt contracts is really the reason behind the difference between these set of papers. Okay, so. Now let me move to the, to the second set of results, and I'm running out of time. So I'm going to define a financial network to be delta connected if there exists a subset M of these banks for which the banks, the commitments of banks in M to commitments of banks in M complement is bounded above by delta and vice versa. So the commitments of banks in M complement to M are also bounded above by delta. If this delta is zero, essentially I have a, uh, I have a disconnected financial network structure. And for delta small, I'm just going to call it weakly connected. So here is a picture. Like you can think this is M, this is M complement. If all these commitments coming from M or inside M is bounded above by delta, this is a delta connected network. So now the, the second set of results is what we call the large shock regime. So remember, this epsilon star and y star are exactly the same uh, numbers from the previous result. So if epsilon now is bigger than epsilon star and y is bigger than y star, now the complete network flips from being the most stable financial network to be the least stable financial network. So it flips, it, it, that's where the phase transition happens. On the other hand, these delta connected structures for delta small enough start strictly outperforming both the complete and the ring. So that's what we meant by the phase transition regime change. With large shocks, the complete is as fragile as the ring. Okay, so just to give you an intuition because I'm running out of time, uh, essentially, the intuition behind this result is that this model has two absorption mechanisms. Uh, 
What is the excess liquidity of the non-distressed banks? So remember, banks which are, do not get the negative shock have some extra cushion that they, they can use to absorb shocks. But then the other one is the senior creditors of the distressed banks uh, which had these claims V. The complete network uses this first mechanism very effectively, more than any other network, because you spread the losses as widely as possible and those other banks can be able to use this, their cushions in absorbing the shock. Whereas weakly connected networks do not use uh, this first mechanism that effectively. However, these weakly connected networks utilize the second mechanism very effectively. Uh, if the size of the shock goes beyond a certain threshold, if the size of the shock is so large that there is not enough liquidity to absorb the shock, well, you would be better off transmitting the losses to the outside of the system. And because the way we are counting uh, social surplus, these outsiders do not have any uh, long-term projects, it's, profit, it's, it's going to increase social surplus when the losses are transmitted to outside of the network. And the complete network does not use this second mechanism that effectively. So I'm um, uh, out of time, so I'm going to skip all this and just get to the very last result. So essentially, we had a framework for studying the relationship between the structure of financial network and the extent of contagion. And we had this phase transition result that small shocks, uh, in, un under small shocks, the more connectivity implies more fragility, whereas this exact the flip, the, the, this monotonicity result flips. More connectivity for large shocks means more fragility. And uh, we had these results on the formation of financial networks, and we showed that they are inefficient in general due to pr the presence of some sort of externality, but I'm going to stop here because I ran out of time. Thank you. Thank you, Alireza. The next uh, speaker is Paul Kupiek. Uh, Paul is currently with the American Enterprise Institute, and he was previously the director of the Center of Financial Service uh, Financial Research at the FDIC. Uh, Paul and I organized a highly productive interagency risk conference together last year. He's known as an original thinker who doesn't shy away from challenging accepted approaches such as the Basel framework or the stress test. So today, Paul is here to share his work on uh, the sensitivity of systemic risk measurement and how it Im impacts the CP designation. Thank you very much, uh, and thank the organizers for inviting me to present this paper today. This is joint work with Levant Gunte, who is a, a colleague of mine at uh, my former institution, the FDIC. And I'd like to point out that these views are the views of Levant's and my views and not the AEI or FDIC views. Uh, the search for systemic risk. Uh, the search for systemic risk measures uh, is, is really all about big business. It focuses on big, complex financial businesses. It's also been a big business opportunity for economists. And if those of you don't know, that might, that's the NYU V Lab where they systemically rate all the large financial institutions, been up there for a few years. But really, it's been a big business opportunity. It's about business, big business, but it really identified systemic risk. And we're going to talk about today that there are really some big risks in the continued use of some of these currently popular systemic risk measures. And we want to, at the start, say maybe, you know, with all the government warning labels we see on things, maybe we should think about putting a government warning label on these measures. And, and just so here's some examples of, of what we see government warnings on the chainsaw, don't hold it on the wrong end. Superman pajamas warning, uh, you can't fly if you have this suit on. I mean, this is an important warning. Another one, don't, you know, don't put your kids in the washing machine it's it spins real fast warning uh, no stupid people beyond this point or you know remember half of the people that you know are below average I mean these are all warning stickers on various things that governments or lawyers have mandated and we just kind of wonder shouldn't these systemic risk measures have have sort of a warning and so we're going to focus on two measures of systemic risk COVAR and MES and COVAR is conditional value at risk and what a conditional value at risk is it's the value at risk of a conditional stock return distribution so instead of taking a general distribution, you condition, condition on some event, and you take the value at risk for that. And it uh, was popularized by Adrian and Brunemeyer, uh, New York Fed economist, uh, in 2011, and it's been around for a while. 
The other is the marginal expected shortfall. And this is the expected shortfall of a conditional return distribution. So again, instead of taking the unconditional return distribution, we have some shock that conditions a return distribution, and we take the expected shortfall. And this was a popularized by Acharya, Engel, and Richardson in 2012, and, and, in the a, and came out in the a, American Economic Youth Proceedings, and, and, and some other papers by, by the authors there. And you probably all are familiar with these. So both COVAR and MES they, they measure, they, they claim to measure tail dependence in returns. So the COVAR and MES are supposed to be a measure of systemic risk. And so if you, if you, if you were to apply the COVAR or MES measure and you get a big number, it's supposed to indicate that the, that the, that the institution has high potential for systemic risk. So the, the intuition is this. So there's tail dependence in the financial return, stock return. So if you have some catastrophic loss in a financial institution, then the probability that that loss is going to cascade to other financial institutions is high. So sort of the catastrophic loss in one institution causes the other financial institutions to have a big loss. So there's sort of this connection in, in tail returns. A big bad event for one financial institution causes other financial t institutions to have a bad return. The same, the same, the, the same intuition holds for non-financial firms. If, if the financial sector suffers a really catastrophic loss, one firm, many firms, then the real side is going to be hurt. Credit, credit supply is going to be constrained. The real economy is going to be hurt. So warning, uh, what's the problem with these measures? The, pro the first problem with these measures is they confound systematic and systemic risk. Um, firms with large systematic risk components are going to have large COVARs and MESs. So just general market beta risk is going to cause big COVARs and big MESs. And so you just can't look at a COVAR number and a big MES without correcting for the fact that they have beta risk and you have to, you have to control for that. The COVAR and the MES papers also take it a step too far and they diagnose systemic risk and recommend treatments without a proper hypothesis test. So they do things like claiming we should tax large institutions or require lots of extra capital or other kinds of things because they have big MESs or, or COVARs and, and we think that's taking it a step too far. They're way ahead in their, their diagnosis. There's no null hypothesis in any of these tests. Um, so there's no, there's no formal hypothesis testing and so what we're going to do is we're going to introduce a formal hypothesis test into these into these tests and show you how the results change one of the things you should ask yourself is if covar and mes measures really measure systemic risk how come if you calculate them for real side firms they're much bigger on average than for financial side firms what's so magic about covar and mes if you calculate them for financial firms you can find firms that have big covars and mes's do it to real side firms there's hundreds more firms that have large covars and mes's do we tax those too are they systemic risk sort of we want to get to the bottom of what's going on here so we, if we take a cross-section of Chris stop returns, 2006, 2007, right before the crisis, 500 daily observations roughly, two years of data, and we regress MES on the market model beta, uh, you get a plot that looks like that. You get, a, you get a very high R squared, and you can see that the higher the beta coefficient, the bigger the, ne the bigger the negative value of the MES. And so you can easily see that there's a strong relationship between MES and the market model beta. If you do the same thing for the COVAR measure, instead it's the correlation it, it, it is the better measure and not the beta. But of course the, the beta is a big part of it's the correlation coefficient. But if you rest it on the correlation coefficient, you again find a big negative uh, slope here. The higher the, the, the correlation, the, 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 the bigger the negative COVAR measure, the bigger the, bigger the systemic risk measure. So we have to pull out systemic risk before we decide whether a COVAR or an MES measure is really an indication of systemic risk. So our contribution to the systemic risk, risk literature is we introduce a proper null hypothesis, a null hypothesis. And the first one we're going to do is stock returns are Gaussian. It's a simple, it's a simple null hypothesis. It's probably too simple to really go forward in the world and, and use this, but it, it's, it's important to make a point. It is, it is a simple hypothesis that people have used for years, and we're going to develop the tests when we have a proper null and see what they look like. Um, we're in the process of working on a much more general null hypothesis, and in the end, I'm going to talk to you, if I have time, I'm going to talk to you about some of the issues there. Anyway, by introducing a null hypothesis into the MES and COVAR test statistics, it allows us to separate systematic risk from systemic risk and to formulate classical hypothesis tests for the presence of, of systemic risk. So if you have Gaussian returns, the tails in the return distribution are independent, asymptotically independent, meaning if you have a very large uh, 
negative return or positive return in one dimension, the probability that you have a, a large return, negative or positive, in the other dimension it, it, it is unrelated. They're independent. Very extreme returns in one dimension do not necessarily generate very extreme returns in another dimension. When you have tail dependence, however, the opposite is true. If you have one dimension of a, of a multivariate distribution way in the tails, if the things are tail dependent, then the probability is much higher that the other, other dimensions of that distribution are going to be in the tails. So that's the idea behind tail dependence. But if returns are gouged, in simple normality, there's no, there's no systemic risk, there's no tail dependence. Now, systemic risk hypothesis really looks at the left-hand tail dependence. It looks at the negative returns. We talked about that. Large negative returns to financial firms cause problems for the rest of the industry. So we're going to now put in the, the proper null hypothesis. So when returns are Gaussian, if you go through the math, you can calculate what the COVAR measure is in terms of the underlying beta coefficients and and volatilities of the stock. And you can see you can get a closed form expression for what the COVAR measure of systemic risk is under, under Gaussian, under normality, multivariate normality. You can also get a closed form expression for what the MES statistic is under normality. So we have a, if, if returns are normal, there's no systemic risk, we have a null hypothesis. We can test to see if things look like this. So our test strategy use is, is, is sort of like a Hausman test. It uses two estimators. Okay, under the Gaussian null hypothesis, the prior two slides give you the efficient estimator for MES and COVAR. They're, 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 they're unbiased, they're, they're, they're smallest variants, uh, and they don't allow tail dependence. The alternative estimators are going to be the alternative estimators that are used in, in the literature, and in COVAR, it's a quantile regression estimator in the 1% tail. Now, that doesn't make any distributional assumptions. So under the null hypothesis, that's going to be unbiased, but it's going to be inefficient. It's going to have a high variance. Under the alternative hypothesis, that if there really is systemic risk, our Gaussian estimators are going to be biased. They're going to be wrong. Okay, They're not going to be able to measure the, 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 the right they're not going to be able to pick it up right. Whereas the, the estimators in the literature, the quantile regression estimator, it's very flexible. It's going to be able to pick up systemic risk. And so it's going to be unbiased under, under the alternative, whereas the, the Gaussian is going to be biased. And that's, that's basically going to set off the test statistic. The MES in the literature estimates the expected uh, return on stocks on days when the market's in its 5% tail. I forgot to mention that. So that's the standard kind of uh, there's no distributional assumptions there. It's a very general technique, but it, but under the null, it's not efficient. So here's a, here's a couple of pictures what I mean about under the null. So under the null, if you if you calculate the parametric uh, the parametric sampling distribution, you get the pink lines. Then that that's from a Monte Carlo experiment with you know 25,000 observations. You you repeat the same thing 25,000 times. You get an estimate. That's what the distribution of the sampling estimator looks like under the null. So the parametric is much more efficient. You can see that the non-parametric has a much wider spread. So this gives, gives rise for the, the Hausman-type test that we're going to construct. Uh, here's a different example with different covariant correlation structure, but the same thing holds. So here's how we're going to do it. Our test statistics evaluate the difference between the two estimators. The estimators in the literature, which are very general and don't impose any distributional assumptions, but they're inefficient if the true distribution is Gaussian. We're going to compare that to the Gaussian very uh, focused estimators. And the difference between those two things is going to give us a test statistic. The problem is it has nuisance parameters. That, test, that difference is going to depend on the correlation, and it's also going to depend on the idiosyncratic risk of the stocks. So we're going to get rid of idiosyncratic risk by scaling those differences. In the COVAR case, we're going to scare it, scale it by the Gaussian COVAR. So that's going to get rid of the idiosyncratic risk nuisance parameter. In the MES, we're going to, sc we're going to scale it. Uh, we, we scale it there too and it gets to get rid of the nuisance parameter, but we're still left with the correlation as a nuisance parameter. Okay, and so I'm going to show you, we, and we can calculate the, the test statistics for these values by doing Monte Carlo simulations under the null hypothesis. This is 25,000 Monte Carlo replications. And what we do is we, we have to vary the correlation of, of, the of, of the stock in the portfolio we're looking at, and we get a series of test statistics. And we can basically do, uh, we can fill in the line. There's, it's a smooth, it's, we get the critical values for the 1%, 10%, and 5%, uh, basically with a small sample distribution study. Now let me show you what we do. We apply it to returns 2006 to 2007. We pull all the stocks that have enough observations to calculate MES and COVAR. 
Uh, we have 380 depository institutions, 139 insurance firms, 101 other financial institutions, 55 broker dealers, 1,000, 1,300 plus manufacturers. We have a lot of firms from different industries. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you what, it, what it looks like here. Two things to know, the MES and the COVAR often disagree about which firms are potentially systemic. The MES rejects the null hypothesis far more frequently, and I'm going to have to show you in some pictures because the data are there. So if you look at these lines, uh, the rejection region is the positive region for the COVAR test, and anything above the green line is rejected at the 5% level. So you can see for the banking depository institutions, we probably have uh, you know, 20 or so, 14 maybe, something like that, institutions that get rejected by COVAR. Same firms, same data, use the MES test statistic. The rejection region now is in the negative region, and you can see that the MES rejects a lot of banks. A lot of banks have systemic risk if you're using MES. Oops. Okay, my screen looks different now. Okay, if we do it for the insurance industry, COVAR doesn't find very many systemic risk firms, just a few. MES finds a lot more. That's a pattern all the way through. You could do it for retail trade. Again, some retail firms are, are systemically important, but more are under MES. You can, you can go through manufacturing. There's a whole lot of systemically important manufacturing firms, uh, more under MES than COVAR. And COVAR and MES often identify different firms. Okay, so here, here are re the retail trade companies retail trade companies that are statistically significant under the COVAR at the 5% level. And there's 14 of them, right? So I don't know, do you think Famous Daves of America is systemically important? Caribou Coffee, maybe Denny's. If, if Denny's closed, where would we go for breakfast? Anyway, if you look under MES, these are the retail firms that are systemically important. And you can find, like, I think, pretty sure Taco Bell's in there. I think I ate there at lunch today. So maybe, yeah, that's systemic. Ross stores. But you get a whole different list. And, and you get firms that are, you know, this is the, the, big, the, big, the, the big numbers. Anyway, if you went to the bank systemic risk measures, if we took the top 25 banks by capitalization in 2006, and we looked at their MES, and we looked at their COVAR test statistics, you'd find that all of them were statistically significant under the MES test statistic at both the 5 and the 10% level. If you took the same institutions, same time period, top 25 bank holding companies, there's only one of them that's statistically significant under the COVAR, and that's Bank of America, and that's the 10% level. So these test statistics give a very different answer, a very different ranking, uh, and this is using, uh, testing it you know, against, against the Gaussian null. So let me wrap up. Here we think the literature is kind of dangerous because, well, it's dangerous to use these numbers without understanding that if you calculate a COVAR and an MES, everything has a COVAR and an MES. It doesn't matter if it's systemically important or not. There, sh there has to be some expected COVAR and MES, and that depends on things like the characteristics of the underlying distribution, like its beta or its correlation. You have to pull all those things out to know if systemic risk is causing the number to be bigger or not. We introduce a null hypothesis to do that. It removes systemic risk uh, contamination. Um, the test has to be improved. Our null hypothesis is way too restrictive. We know stocks are not Gaussian. They have fat tails. Now, what really is, we're, we're working on this. Um, we're not quite there yet. We're working on it. But we're, if, you, if you think about skewed T versus Gaussian, skewed Gaussian distribution, one of the questions can ask, can the, what do the tail dependence measures look like under distributions that are, that are really close? Does COVAR or MES even have a chance of sort of detecting what tail dependence is? And when you go into this literature, you'll find that the, the tail dependence measures of these distributions, when you work them out close form, depend on correlation, they depend on idiosyncratic risk, they depend on a lot of things. So putting down the right null hypothesis and figuring out what the test statistics should look, look, look like under the null is, is going to be a complicated task. These, these numbers, even, you know, if you generalize the test, the, the underlying distribution that you're willing to tolerate as the null hypothesis and not representative of systemic risk, it introduces a whole lot more complications, and we're working on that. One of the things that's, that's kind of interesting, I have two minutes left, wow, talk too fast. One of the things that's really interesting, you take a, just, a, just take a standard, I'll, I'll slow down now, I got two minutes. Take a standard student T distribution, standard two, student T, two-dimensional. If you look at the tail dependence measure, we all know if you read textbooks, uh, you know, extreme value theory, the normal is, is, is uh, asymptotically tail independent. The T is, student T is tail dependent. Now, what does tail dependent mean? Well, it means 
If you take the limit of these two things as the probability goes to one, that you know, if one's in the tail, the other one's going to be in the tail, or the probability of the other one in the tail is non-zero. But the probability that the other dimension is in the tail can be any number between just a little bit above zero or one, right? And so what, what does systemic risk mean in terms of tail de in dependence? So if, if the banking system tanks, but there's only a 0.1% probability that the real port a real sector portfolio tanks, is that systemic risk? How big does that probability that either the other financial portfolio or the real sector portfolio, how big does that probability that the other portfolio tank have to be before we say there's systemic risk there? Now, what, what the measures in the literature say right now, if there's any tail dependence at all, that's systemic risk. Well, first of all, you can't measure tail dependence when it's like 0.01 or 0.001. It's got to be a number like 0.45 or 0.5, which means the correlations have to be big and other things. So, Figuring out what null hypothesis is really you're really willing to entertain as a null hypothesis that's general enough to look like return distributions and, and also one that you're willing to say, I don't think that has systemic risk in it, right? Because T distributions fit stock returns and been done it since Fama time, right? 1970s. We knew T distributions fit stock returns. We didn't say they had systemic risk. We just said they had fatter tails than the normal. So it's probably not just that you have tail dependence, it's probably some threshold amount of tail dependence that, that we're really going to have a, a discussion about. What level of that you know, is consistent with systemic risk? And, and that's sort of where we are right now, and we're, we're working on that. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Paul. The next speaker is Art Merton. Art is the director of the FDIC's uh, Office of Complex Financial Institutions. He is the FDIC's key person for the resolution of CFIs. During the recent banking crisis, Art was on the front line for the FDIC and served as the acting chief operating officer. He also led the implementation of the FDIC's temporary liquidity, liquidity guarantee program. Art. Great, thank you, John. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll give the usual disclaimer. My remarks don't represent the views of the FDIC and certainly not the Federal Reserve System. Um, so I'm going to talk about Dodd-Frank and the new authorities that it gave the FDIC. And if you think back to 2008, um, the financial crisis that we experienced, um, policymakers faced two pretty unattractive choices uh, when they were faced with a troubled financial firm. Uh, they could uh, allow it to go through the bankruptcy process and see what the result of that was, uh, or they could intervene and provide extraordinary government support, uh, essentially bail out the firm. Um, the, they tried both, um, and uh, Dodd-Frank was a reaction to that, and Dodd-Frank gave the FDIC uh, two new authorities, uh, one of them joint with the Federal Reserve, uh, to try to address that and to try to give policymakers uh, better choices when faced with uh, a troubled financial firm. So the first uh, is Title I of the Dodd-Frank Act, and Title I is broader. It, it involves heightened prudential standards that are uh, under the purview of the Federal Reserve, but one part of that is 165D, uh, which is basically the resolution plan requirement, the living, so-called living wills. And under this, the Federal Reserve and the FDIC are um, tasked with implementing this. And the requirement is that certain firms, certain large firms, financial firms, uh, demonstrate with their plans that they could be resolved under the bankruptcy code without disruption to the financial system. And again, that's resolved under the bankruptcy code, um, not Title II. Um, and these plans would be submitted to the FDIC and the Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve and the FDIC may determine that the plan is not credible or would not facilitate an orderly resolution under bankruptcy. Uh, if the FDIC and the Federal Reserve make that finding, there are certain uh, steps that then could be taken, uh, required the firm to take, such as uh, more stringent capital, liquidity, or uh, restrictions on operations. Um, uh, and if, if that doesn't uh, meet the test, if those steps don't do it, then further steps could be taken, including requiring divestiture of certain operations or assets of the firm. So we have um, put in place some rules on the resolution plans, and firms have submitted their plans. Uh, they've been done in three ways, but 
focus on the first wave, which is 11 firms, 11 of the largest firms. They first submitted plans mid-year 2012, um, and then they uh, just submitted their second submission in October of last year. And after the first submission, uh, the Federal Reserve and the FDIC uh, looked at the plans that had been submitted. Um, the first submission was essentially uh, a pass. The, the plans, it was indicated that the plans wouldn't be reviewed uh, under that standard. It was more informational. And after the FDIC and the Federal Reserve took a look at that uh, in the spring of 2013, we issued some guidance to the firms to help them with their second submissions. And in that guidance, we identified five classes of obstacles that the firms were asked to overcome uh, in their resolution plans. And these obstacles included uh, multiple competing insolvencies, uh, the idea that different parts of the firm would be subject to different uh, administrative pr procedures, uh, the need for global cooperation, uh, what will these firms operate in many jurisdictions, uh, how do you avoid ring fencing and other uh, uh, actions, um, operations and interconnectedness, trying to maintain the continuity of critical operations of these firms during the re and after the resolution. Um, counterparty actions, this is the notion that counterparties, particularly uh, counterparties with QFCs, qualified financial contracts, derivatives and so forth, um, are able to take actions to terminate the contracts and seize collateral and, and exacerbate the problems. And then finding, finally, funding and liquidity uh, are a challenge in uh, bankruptcy. So the firms were asked to submit the plans and demonstrate that they could overcome these obstacles. And those plans or second submissions are now under review. Um, another part of uh, Dodd-Frank related to this was the non-bank designations by the uh, FSOC, the, uh, the Financial Stability Oversight Council that was created by Dodd-Frank. Um, the notion was that it wasn't just bank holding companies uh, that, that uh, created uh, uh, risk in the system in 2008. So the idea was that the FSOC could designate non-bank firms as um, uh, systemically important and subject them to the Title I standards, including the living will process. So far, the FSOC has designated three firms, uh, AIG, GE Capital, and, and Prudential. And those firms will be submitting uh, resolution plans this July. Uh, that's it for Title I and the resolution plans. For Title II is the orderly liquidation authority that Dodd-Frank gave the FDIC. And this is basically the, it gave the FDIC the ability to resolve uh, not just insured depository institutions, commercial banks and thrifts, but also bank holding companies, uh, certain affiliates of, of, of the banks um, and, and other firms. Um, and these authorities are very much like the authorities we have under the FDI Act for commercial banks and thrifts. And this allows the, uh, the policymakers to place a CIFI into Title II, the FDIC receivership process, if it's deemed that the resolution under bankruptcy would have an adverse effect on the U.S. financial stability. Um, the goal of the orderly liquidation authority, uh, there are a few of them that, that are inherent in this. Um, the first is that shareholders and creditors and management of the, of the firm should be held accountable um, and that they should suffer losses, um, that the stability of the U.S. financial system should be maintained, um, and that the, uh, the resolution should impose losses uh, in accordance with the statute priorities, and it should be done without cost to the U.S. taxpayers. Uh, I'll skip this slide. This is similar to the last one. Um, so what's the challenge for resolving these CIFIs? Um, at least for the U.S. firms, uh, the large uh, financial firms, uh, they operate in multiple jurisdictions and uh, they're highly integrated, their operations across legal entities. Their business lines are typically not aligned with legal entities, um, and as you know, re resolution occurs based on legal entities, not on business lines. Um, and the funding um, is generally dispersed among the affiliates uh, as the need arises. So all of these create complications uh, for a resolution. 
So what the FDIC has done in the last few years is it's been in the process of developing a strategy that's known as the single point of entry strategy. Uh, and I have to give credit for my predecessors, uh, Jim Wigan and others who really worked on this uh, strategy um, and have developed it. But the notion is that you take advantage of the structure of U.S. bank holding companies or financial holding companies, which is that they typically have a holding company at the top that is typically not operational. And that holding company at the top uh, uh, holds the uh, equity investments in the, in the subsidiaries. And the idea is that you would place the parent company, the, the top company, into this Title II receivership. Uh, and you would expose the shareholders and creditors of the top company uh, to losses, and you would replace the management. Um, but at the same time, you would keep the operating subsidiaries open. And so what this allows is you to have continuity of the critical operations, so there's less di disruption in the financial system. But it also allows you to hold the uh, proper parties accountable uh, for the risks and the losses in this resolution. So the way it works, you start by placing, as I said, the top parent company into receivership. Uh, you essentially, and then you create a bridge company, uh, a bridge financial holding company, and you transfer the assets of the receivership into that bridge holding company, and you leave the liabilities behind in the receivership. Um, and as I, I said, you replace the management and the officers and directors and the board. The next challenge then is funding. You want the uh, new company to be able to access funding. And we expect that um, the new bridge company, because we've transferred the assets of the estate to the new bridge company but left behind the liabilities, should be a well-capitalized bridge company. And it should be able to remain uh, to access funding. Its subsidiaries have uh, been able to stay open, and we expect that they should be able to access market funding. However, if if that private sector funding is not immediately available, Dodd Frank does provide uh, a tool, the Orderly Liquidation Fund, that the FDIC can use in order to gain access to funding in this resolution. Uh, this is essentially a line of credit from the Treasury. Uh, that can be used. It's only available, uh, it's limited by the assets in the estate, uh, the amount that we can borrow, and uh, if necessary, uh, if the proceeds from the estate were not sufficient to repay whatever borrowings under the OLF, the FDIC is then required to assess financial firms, the other existing financial firms, in order to repay the borrowings from the OLF. So the idea is that taxpayers would be protected uh, both by the assets of the estate and by the ability to assess the uh, other uh, financial firms. Um, this, this OLF, um, in a sense, is structured somewhat similar to the uh, line of credit that the FDIC has long had with the uh, Treasury for normal bank resolutions. It's limited essentially to 90 percent of the assets of the estate. Um, so we're not allowed to borrow the full amount. We have to put a haircut. And again, it's paid back through an assessment similar to what we would do uh, in typical uh, FDIC resolutions. On the claims, Dodd-Frank um, sets receivership claims. Uh, and uh, it's what you would expect, shareholders first, uh, subordinated debt, and then the unsecured liabilities. There is the ability to treat similarly situated creditors differently, but that's subject to restrictions. Um, and if we were to do that, it's uh, only available if it's necessary to maximize the return to the creditors left in the receivership uh, or to uh, continue the operations of the bridge company. Um, the FDIC, that's what the statute provides, the FDIC is issued some rules to further limit uh, the discretion that we would exercise in one of these resolutions. Um, the, the FDIC, uh, after creating the bridge holding company, uh, we would have presumably the operations would be stabilized. You would have new board and new management. Um, and then we would go through a process of uh, satisfying the claims on the receivership by exchanging them for uh, 
equity and debt in this new in a newly formed company so that you would the bridge company would turn into a, a new company that would essentially be owned uh, by the former uh, creditors and shareholders of the creditors most likely of the of the previous company and that would be done by issuing these new securities um, we should point out that um, our thinking is that this new company that would emerge from this resolution would be a firm that could be resolved without resort to Title II. In other words, it would not be a SIFI. Um, this, is, uh, this shows the capital stack and how this, this capitalization of the new co works. Um, it's probably a little hard to see, but the idea is that um, essentially, what you have on the on the left hand side is uh, the company before failure, and then on the right hand side, you see that the losses have exceeded the equity claims. They've exceeded the sub debt, and they've made their way into the unsecured claims. Um, and what you do then is uh, convert the some of that unsecured debt into new equity in the uh, newly formed company. Um, and you see at the top, you might leave a little bit of subordinated debt in there in case you had, you needed some more to convert later. Um, this past December, the FDIC put out a request for public comment on this single point of entry. Um, we described the uh, single point of entry strategy. Uh, this was the first time that the FDIC had done that in a formal document. Uh, issued uh, under a board vote by the FDIC. Um, and we sought comment on some of the issues that had been identified in the uh, development of this, of this strategy. And some of the issues that we were seeking comment on were the disparate treatment, possible dis disparate treatment of creditors, the use of OLF funding, um, the question of whether there was a uh, uh, funding advantage for CIFIs uh, and whether a single point of entry affected that in what way. Um, also, uh, we asked for comment on the need for long-term debt at the, at the parent company. Um, obviously, our strategy relies on that debt being there. And as you may be aware, the Federal Reserve Board is working on a uh, proposed rule uh, governing long-term debt issued by these holding companies. Um, and then finally, we sought comment on the foreign operations and how they might be dealt with under this strategy. Um, one of the things that's pretty critical to getting this right and being in a position to actually perform one of these resolutions is the need for international coordination. And since the Dodd-Frank, we've been very actively involved, the FDIC has been, with foreign jurisdictions, um, particularly the United Kingdom, where uh, most of the financial activity of the U.S.-based SIFIs is. Um, the, the FDIC in the U.K., the Bank of England, issued a paper at the end of 2012, a joint paper describing uh, the resolution strategies that each jurisdiction would expect to use. Uh, we've uh, engaged with the Germans and the Swiss and the Japanese. Uh, to do similar exercises. Um, we did a tabletop exercise with the United Kingdom at the end of last year, a staff level tabletop, uh, where we went through the resolution of uh, our respective firms. Um, and we're planning to do a principal level tabletop exercise between the US and the UK later this year. Um, we've also uh, engaged with the European Commission. As you may know, there's a lot of activity going on uh, in setting up resolution authority in Europe. Uh, and we've been working with the European Commission on that. Uh, we set up a joint working group where we uh, twice a year meet in person uh, and, and work through some of the issues. Um, and so we've, uh, we've been really actively involved on a bilateral basis with a number of these key jurisdictions. Um, in addition to the bilateral work, we're also heavily involved in the work of the Financial Stability Board. So, you know, this is a group that uh, has really uh, uh, become more important since the crisis in terms of uh, what's going on in, around the world in terms of financial regulation. Um, the Financial Stability Board, the FSB, has set up a resolution steering group that the FDIC is a member of. 
And that group has been working on a variety of um, initiatives, including something called crisis management groups. This is uh, each jurisdiction is required to hold a crisis management group for each of its CIFIs. Um, and this is where the host country, the home country, invites the host countries, uh, the relevant host countries for its CIFI to uh, go through an exercise where we work through how one of these firms would be resolved. Um, GLAC, I have to stop now. GLAC uh, is gone concern, loss absorbing capacity. I can tell you all about that later. Um, and then uh, cross-border recognition, trying to deal with some of the tricky issues there, including these QFC contracts. And I'll just stop by saying one of these tangible example of this international coordination is uh, four of the jurisdictions, the US, UK, Germany, and, and Swiss wrote a letter to ISDA encouraging them to change the master agreements so that these termination clauses uh, won't allow uh, early termination. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Uh, the next speaker is Richard Herring. Uh, Professor Herring is the distinguished chair professor at the Wharton School and also a founding director of the Wharton Financial Institution Center. He is currently a member of the FDIC Systemic Resolution Advisory Committee, the Hoover Institute Working Group on Resolution, and the Systemic Risk Council. Dick has been writing and speaking on cross-border issues in resolution since the 1990s, well before they received much attention. So now I'm turning to, uh, to Dick. Thank you very much, Jalapa, and, and thanks to uh, Haluk and to Bill and uh, I guess to Franklin as well for inviting me to appear. Um, I'm delighted to be part of this panel. I'm only sorry that I have to teach all day tomorrow and don't get to hear the rest. Uh, what I'd like to do is is actually um, set what Art said in a little bit of in a little bigger framework. I would like to kind of reinterpret Dodd Frank, which is not an entirely coherent document if you've ever troubled to read through it. But I'd like to reinterpret it as an attempt to end too big to fail, because I think that is the more or less consistent theme you can read throughout it. And um, there's essentially a very broad regulatory assault on trying to end too big to fail. We'll end by asking just how successful it seems to be. But it imposes higher liquidity requirements on very large firms, higher capital requirements, enhanced supervision and regulation, limitations on some activities, uh, constraints on what both the Fed, the FDIC, and the Treasury can do so that they can't get around the constraints on too big to fail, um, rapid resolution plans that Art described very effectively, and um, greatly expanded powers for the FDIC to resolve, um, I'm going to call them globally systemically important banks, but F I keep getting corrected about which is the uh, term du jour, but uh, I'm talking about the bank parts now. Um, it's, I think, fitting that we ponder this at this time because we're almost hard upon the 30th anniversary of the very um, articulation of the concept of too big to fail. It occurred, of course, with the collapse of continental Illinois in 1984 in, I guess, May instead of April, but we're very, very close. Um, and continental Illinois received unprecedented support from the Fed, the FDIC, and they ended up really guaranteeing everything, even some of the creditors of the holding company. Um, when Todd Conover, the controller of the currency, was testifying in Congress about why it failed despite the fact it had such excellent supervision, um, he said that, well, in fact, there were 11 of the largest banks in the United States that were too big to fail. And as far as I can tell, that's the first time the words were uttered. Um, obviously, it did wonders for the stocks of those 11 firms, but everybody began to ask, who was 12? Under what measure did you look at it? It was not very helpful. But it was identified as a major problem. Um, what does it mean? Well, you're going to hear from George Kaufman tomorrow that it doesn't mean much. Uh, and at some level, I don't disagree with him, but it has become a catch-all term. And I think uh, the FSB has done a, a decent job of capturing the, the several aspects of it. It's certainly more than size. In fact, some very large firms may not be um, in this category at all. But they usually are correlated with size, things like global activity, interconnectedness, availability of, of ready substitutes so that can we live perfectly well without you or not, 
and complexity both in terms of legal structure and involvement in opaque markets. Uh, but I think Gary Stern really had the best definition um, because he basically said it's too big to fail if the regulators are afraid to resolve it uh, because they're simply afraid that uh, you'll have too much spillover damage to the rest of the financial system. And I think he was on the money there. And I think that's why it's so important to be focusing on resolution tools because in the absence of the kind of tools that, that Art and his colleagues are working on, uh, I think there's no prospect that, that regulators would ever take a chance at, at trying to resolve one of these entities. Um, well, what have regulators done in the uh, 30 intervening years since the, the problem was first identified? The answer is not much. They've paid very little notion to it except in relying on what I consider to be a really silly doctrine of constructive ambiguity. I think, first of all, it's naive because um, unless you can really convince Marcus that you're going to determine policy by the flip of a coin, and I think there are other problems if you do succeed in that, then the markets are going to assume what is a plausible, rational thing to do, which is that you're going to intervene to help too big to fail banks. Uh, and it's really, I think, a prime example of the time and consistency problem. Ex ante, regulators and all of us would love for everybody to act as if these firms were just normal firms that could be resolved like anything else. But ex post, when you look at the abyss, inevitably they get bailed out. Um, and in fact, if the regulators do depart from the predetermined script, as they did with Lehman Brothers, and there's a lot of uh, evidence that they really did consider Lehman too big to fail because they spent that incredible weekend trying to find a solution, destructive ambiguity, constructive ambiguity becomes destructive ambiguity. And it's no surprise that there were a huge cluster of failures worldwide after Lehman Brothers. They didn't have a direct link to Lehman Brothers. What they did have was the presumption before Lehman Brothers that they would be bailed out. And after they appeared to change the rules of the game, you could no longer think that with much uh, particular uh, confidence. I think it's also interesting to note that not only did our regulators do nothing in particular to uh, try to end too big to fail, uh, but they in fact facilitated banks getting larger and larger. Uh, in general, the Justice Department has deferred to the Fed in mergers, and the Fed has taken what I would call a fairly relaxed view. I'm not objecting to it, I'm just sort of observing it. I think they have the view that most markets for banking services are contestable. We've had lots of innovations that compete. Um, they've generally had a laissez-faire view of mergers. And what the piece of it that I am critical of is that when they get in a pinch, they actually make a still bigger bank. And mega mergers have, been, have actually contributed a lot to making too big to fail banks emphatically too big to fail. Um, it wasn't really until the debate over accepting Basel II that the Fed was really forced to think much about competition policy. And you may recall that Basel II was rigged to favor large banks. Large banks were going to get a lower capital requirement if they satisfied for the internal ratings approach. Uh, small banks were not stupid. They finally caught on, and they have a lot of power in Congress. Um, and so the Fed was compelled to produce studies about four key markets to see whether or not uh, there was a competitive advantage. Well, three of them showed it didn't matter much. One of the studies got the wrong answer, so they did it again. But it was simply an indication that um, you know it was not something they much wanted to focus on. So. This has not been the problem in the U.S. that it has been elsewhere. Uh, the blue line is uh, the U.S., which has obviously increased in concentration, but we're still nowhere near as concentrated as other major markets in the world. Uh, but it has increased after the crisis. Uh, during 2000-2010, failures eliminated uh, 318 U.S. commercial banks. That was about 6% of deposits, a smaller number of banks. Since 1970, the five largest bank holding companies have tripled their market share, um, and more than half of the small banks have disappeared. Uh, by 2010, the five largest banks held more than half of all banking assets. Uh, and to some extent, this was the direct result of panicky government policies to facilitate mergers during the crisis. Some of the worst ones didn't happen. Wachovia could have merged with Citi, uh, but that didn't, in fact, come off.
Um, and oddly, there was really no attention along the way to the fact that these very policies were making our too-big-to-fail problem even worse. I think there's been a realization since then. Um, also, we've seen a decline in new entrants in the system. I would assert that at least partly that's because we've really increased the fixed costs of regulation so that it's a harder um, business to enter. And there's a lot of uncertainty about how much tougher it's going to be as you look ahead because, as you know, uh, there's still about half of Dodd-Frank that is, remains to be implemented. But what happened is that the U.S. emerged from the crisis with a much more concentrated banking system. Not so much concentrated as everybody else, but more concentrated. The major regulatory response, of course, was the Dodd-Frank Act. And as you know, um, it's unlikely that anybody who voted for it actually read it. Some of us actually have. It's mind-numbing. But it's also interesting that as long as it is, which is 2,329 pages, it's very nonspecific. It, it requires 81 studies, 93 reports, 500 rulemakings, and each of these can be thousands of pages. So even though it's four years later, we're not quite sure what it's all going to look like in the end, but we know it's going to get more complicated and more onerous. Uh, but what I'd like to look at is the parts that focus on limiting the growth and power of the GSIBs. Um, what you can see is a real change in U.S. policy that is intended to make life tougher for a GSIB. Uh, we're putting differentially heavy capital requirements on them. We're putting differentially heavy uh, liquidity requirements. We're putting some activity restrictions. Um, and all of these things are sort of graduated to be more onerous as you get larger. Um, the uh, liquidity requirement that will be finally uh, imposed uh, there's one that, that is still being talked about in principle, I assume we'll get around to it, but the liquidity coverage ratio is, is about to roll online, and the U.S. has actually chosen a stricter definition in the numerator, um, unlike some of the Europeans who are willing to let almost anything go into the uh, numerator, uh, the Fed wants to be assured that our high quality liquid assets really do look liquid in most scenarios, and there's greater emphasis on uh, the dangers of wholesale funding. Um, what the regulators want, which I think is sensible, is to show that that liquidity is sufficient under a variety of, of stress tests. And in addition to that, there are a whole array of qualitative liquidity standards that are imposed on it. That it's a lot of process, um, all of which is costly, but much of which probably uh, is going to support the quantitative standards. The theme of Dodd-Frank has been more and better capital. So we've raised the ratios, both the leverage ratios and the uh, risk-adjusted ratios, and we've narrowed the definition of what high-quality capital is. And to me, this is probably the real breakthrough in thinking at the Basel Committee. They put together a, a really uh, ragged definition of Tier 1 and Tier 2 capital in the beginning, and it was such a difficult political compromise, they didn't want to touch it again. Now at least they have some clarity about what they're looking at. There is going concern capital, which is the stuff you want to have if you want to keep the system running, and there's going concern capital. And I think that's an important distinction. But the point of this is that they have reduced <clears throat> the range of things they'll call capital, they've increased the amount of it you have to hold, and they've actually increased the risk-weighted assets in the denominator. The Collins Amendment, which was uh, appeared really at the last minute, was aimed particularly at constraining the GSIBs. It was an attempt to um, deter these banks from gaming the risk weights, and there's a widespread belief that lots of <clears throat> firms had pretty successful steered their way through the existing risk weights. And so it established a floor for both the risk weight and the leverage ratios that were based on Basel I. And uh, the idea is that uh, no matter what you do with your internal models after that, you're not going to get less capital than you have had to hold under the Basel I scenario. Um, they attempted to penalize the size and complexity by requiring higher capital requirements on firms that engage significantly in derivative securitization products, financial guarantees, securities borrowing and lending, repos, etc. Who does this? Well, it's the GSIBs and their kin. Uh, there are now multiple capital ratios, and if we had a little more time, I'd, I'd rant on about how unnecessarily more ratios there are. But remember, not only are the, there are these ratios with the various add-ons, but there are at least three kinds of capital you can put against them. So um, I was 
talking to a, a bank officer not long ago, he said they ha basically had to track 31 ratios. Um, not only that, but we followed what I think is kind of an interesting approach that the Financial Stability Board introduced um, by classifying the globally uh, significant international banks. Notice we have eight of ours in the group. Citibank has actually worked its way out of the fourth tier down to the third tier. But I think the interesting feature of it is that top box, the empty box, 3.5%, which I believe is there as a warning to all GSIBs not to become even larger and even more complex because there will be a penalty. Um, we've also toughened the prompt corrective action rules. Um, I think even some of us who felt we were involved in introducing the idea felt it didn't really work in the crisis. Part of that was the thresholds were set too low. Part of it was that uh, it's still based on accounting values. Uh, but I think the uh, obvious example is Citigroup, which was very well capitalized even when its share value fell to penny stock uh, levels. This simply compares what we're doing to what the rest of the world is doing. And this points out that we're also going to add um, additional leverage requirements to the bank holding company. But let me show you an odd an anomaly here. Um, we're doing a 3% add-on to the insured depository institution, but we're adding a mere 2% at the bank holding company, which somehow seems inconsistent with the notion that, that uh, the bank holding company, shareholders and creditors, are going to be responsible for covering the whole bank. Um, in practice, capital requirements are, are significantly higher uh, because we've also implemented the CCAR reviews. And as you know, uh, as several banks found out, uh, having the minimum is not nearly good enough if you're looking at a very dire scenario. Um, I think it all began with the SCAP reviews, which were, I think most people would regard, critical in restoring confidence in the system. We applied it to the 19 largest banks, <clears throat> and um, we made a commitment to publicly disclose the re results, which was a pretty gutsy move, as, as uh, uh, Dr. Flosser uh, noted in the beginning. Uh, and it's an important one, because I don't think there would have been much impact on confidence otherwise. The odd result, though, is that 11 of them failed. Um, which in a way was a good thing because it meant you realize it wasn't a softball test, but it was a good thing only because we had a ready way to recapitalize them. We required that they take money from the SCAP fund so that they were properly capitalized. And this is the problem the Europeans are up against now. They're going to try to run an honest review, but they haven't really yet marshaled a way to, to do the recapitalization. So it, it introduced a new supervisory tool, <clears throat> and it obviously is, is having big impacts on what the effective capital requirements are. And it's really putting the Fed more deeply into the business of, of uh, actually running the bank than it's ever been before. It, it has final say in some respects over dividend distributions and buybacks. Uh, the Volcker Act, of course, was an attempt to limit activities directly. Uh, proprietary trading in particular, it um, in some sense went beyond uh, Glass-Steagall, when I was on a panel when he first described it, and at the time it sounded like nostalgia for Glass-Steagall, but he's just saying proprietary trading has to be out of there altogether, and he's limited involvement with hedge funds and um, with uh, uh, private equity funds. There are also limits on non-organic growth, which aren't necessarily talked about a lot, but they're there. Um, you can't merge your way into being a larger bank if you hit the 10% of total liability um, uh, limit. It also limits government's ability to uh, provide a bailout. Um, quite frankly, Congress was appalled to learn the peak amounts that the Fed had lent and the average daily amounts uh, without the knowledge or approval of Congress or the executive branch. They were particularly appalled to learn that half the recipients were foreign banks. Uh, and this was information, of course, the Fed did not gladly uh, disclose. Uh, it was after a, a Freedom of Information Act appeal by Bloomberg to the Supreme Court. Uh, the Fed responded with a data dump that they thought nobody was going to sort through. But two very determined reporters actually did and found out what the bilateral amounts were. Uh, notice that we were, without knowing it, from 2007 to 2010, actually contributing something like $21 billion a day on average to supporting Royal Bank of Scotland. Um, and if you look down the list, um, more than half the names are, are in fact foreign. Uh, Congress was not amused. 
Um, they, so they actually constrain the ability of the Fed to lend to individual institutions. The Fed is prohibited from providing emergency liquidity assistance to individual institutions. Uh, let me make two more points, if I may. Um, and they have to disclose the identity of borrowers with a two-year lag, which is something the Fed doesn't really like. The mid-level holding companies that they're now complaining about, I think, are a direct consequence of this because they, it, at, looking back at the institutions we lent to, it's very clear they did not make U.S. regulatory standards when we were lending. They also attempt to limit the ability of the FDIC and the Treasury to um, provide assistance, except in the ways in which Dodd-Frank allows. Uh, the FDIC is prohibited from guaranteeing debt of insured solvent banks. They can't undertake open bank assistance unless it makes a whole series of onerous requirements. And the Treasury's favorite slush fund, the Exchange Equalization Fund, can no longer be used for guarantees, as it was with the Money Market Neutral Fund. In essence, Congress wants to control all assistance, and we all know that that does create some genuine ambiguity of how that's going to happen. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, finally, there was an attempt to improve resolution policy, which I think Art has, has gone over very, very well. Um, and I think this may be, in fact, the most important uh, feature of the act, because in the absence of this, none of this matters. If not anybody believes that you can actually resolve one of these institutions without creating intolerable spillovers, it just won't happen. And as he noted, um, there's a lot of emphasis on making it all happen under bankruptcy, and I think the FDIC very wisely uh, put a self-constraint on fiddling with the priorities you would get under bankruptcy so that it will look like that. Um, but the idea is to put a lot of emphasis on planning and strategy and simplification. Uh, my quarrel is that we don't have very, a very good way of monitoring progress with either <clears throat> from either the bank's view or the regulator's view. There's just not enough transparency around the, the whole process. Um, as uh, Art in, uh, emphasized, Title II, and this I think is really a, a spark of, in, of really ingenuity, it's called the Orderly Liquidation Authority. But the FDIC, in implementing it, has made it more or less the equivalent of, of Chapter 11 resolution because they're trying to save going concern value. They're not trying to liquidate the bank. And so it's, it's sort of a triumph of uh, bureaucratic uh, ingenuity over congressional language. Um, the, and of course, any GSIB worth worrying about is, is uh, cross-border, so you really got to worry about how you do this. Um, are there signs of progress? Well, certainly the banks are still getting bigger. Only a couple of them have gotten a little smaller since this happened. And we can get into a whole long debate about whether there is a subsidy, but I think most studies come out with the answer, yeah, uh, it looked a lot bigger in the crisis, as you would expect it did, because that's when you needed the subsidy most. Uh, but we could certainly argue about the details. I would like to pose some questions, Ernie. Um, in essence, what we're trying to do with Dodd Frank is create incentives for big, complex institutions to be smaller. Uh, and so the question is: Are we putting enough sanctions in place to eliminate the implicit subsidy? And I think. It's not yet clear whether we really are. Um, the authorities have always had the power to impose losses on holders of sub subordinated debt, but they were determined not to do so. So you've got to ask, will they really be willing to implement this new tougher regime in a crisis? And, and underneath it all, you know there's a, a really difficult political problem. It's always easier to impose losses on a diffuse set of taxpayers rather than a narrow self-interested group who will uh, lobby really heavily to uh, keep it from happening. Um, will bank holding companies be required to issue enough unsecured debt and equity? Well, we don't know. Um, the Fed is going its way. Um, it, it put out this rule for less uh, capital at the holding company level, and we don't know if that's enough to actually make good on the plan to actually uh, back up the, the entire group. Um, and will it be clear that an institution that exits Title II, and this is a point that I made that I think needs to be emphasized, is going to be so restructured that it will no longer be a Title II type institution? Because if that doesn't happen, there will be a sense that it's just a bailout by another name. Um, foreigners are worried that Title II is uh, useful only if Americans are worried about their financial system. I presume we'll take a, a broader view, but foreigners do worry about those things. 
And I think the tough case for this to answer is, what if the cause of the insolvency is a huge insolvency at a foreign subsidiary that basically exhausts all of that capital absorption at the bank holding company? What will we do in that case? Um, the FDIC cannot say that they're guaranteeing all of the operating subsidiaries. Much of the language stops just short of that, but you can't possibly say you'll do that because we don't want to guarantee all the operating subsidiaries. But once people have a doubt about whether the subsidiary they're dealing with is going to be protected, then you're back into the whole problem of contagion when you intervene. Um, and uh, the um, FDIC uh, has a problem that Art mentioned with uh, all of these contracts that could be triggered by intervention at the holding company because they're written in such a way that you can do a, a closeout. So uh, it's, I think, a, a bold venture. I think it's a creative solution. Um, but it's also going to be difficult in lots of ways, not least of which is that um, it probably will work for one bank. It's hard to imagine it working for more than one. If that doesn't work, then uh, the topic about breaking up the banks becomes more lively. Got it. Um, I don't think we're going to go that far, but there's certainly a lot of people who say if banks are too big to fail, they're simply too big. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much, Dick. The last speaker is Sandra Lawson, uh, Managing Director at Goldman Sachs. As a director of the Global Markets Institute, Sandra is involved in formulating Goldman Sachs' approach to regulatory initiatives, including the Dodd-Frank Act and the Basel regulations. She has also been involved in industry advocacy efforts related to the cross-border resolution of CFIS. So, Sandra. Thanks. I um, want to just add my thanks to those of my fellow panelists, to the Philadelphia Fed and the other conference organizers for having us here for such a really interesting panel today. Um, to end up the day, I would like to switch the focus a little bit from systemic risk to systemic resilience. And one way we have thought about this internally is the notion of thinking about too big to fail from an economic perspective. Um, it's not so difficult to go back and change all of the things that led to the last crisis, but that of course doesn't get you to uh, preventing the next crisis. Um, and it's uh, easy to want to, and understandable to want to put layer upon layer of protection. Um, but our view is when you look at what's been done so far by regulators and by the uh, industry itself, in terms of um, economic importance, we really are quite far along the path to ending too big to fail. And this is, comes in two parts, which I will talk about. The first more, that's capital, and then secondly, the planning for resolution, because I think that's a really critical part. Um, so uh, I don't know that this slide is so easy to read, but basically it just shows you that in 2007, most of the banks were really woefully undercapitalized, even though on paper they appeared to be adequately capitalized. Um, tier one capital was very low, uh, and a lot of types of loss absorbing capital that were thought to be loss absorbing turned out not to be during the crisis. Jump ahead to late last year, and the story is very different. You have um, tier one equity of close to 12%, 11 and a half, we'll say, and most most of this is um, is tier one common. So you have much more capital better quality capital. You also have higher risk weights that, that really align the capital more directly with the economic risks that's faced. So I think from a resiliency point, you're in a much better position than you were in 07 or early 08. And the CCAR exercise reinforces this every year um, by ensuring that there is in fact sufficient capital and it's not just a backward looking indicator. There's also a question of the incentives that this creates, because you could say, well, in 07 or 08, when you have um, management and shareholders of a really honestly thinly capitalized organization, they their incentives are to go for broke, right? Not to recapitalize, but actually to try to um, win back uh, what they've lost and you know benefit it, um, because they have very little to lose. Incentives are different now because the equity holder stakes are so much higher that they have much more to lose if they don't recapitalize early. And so our view is that management 
on the whole would much prefer to take some dilution, limited dilution, recapitalize early, rather than face the prospect of being wiped out and it's actually a very significant amount. Um, I think there are also better incentives for regulators because they can feel with, with, I think, a high degree of confidence that they can force banks to act now, again, early in a stress situation without the risk of triggering a crisis at that bank or a broader systemic crisis because there is this very adequate cushion, there is a clear process around it, um, around early and preventive action, um, and this should, I think, reassure them and uh, give them the flexibility and the confidence to act a bit earlier than before. Um, and in fact, I think we would say, and I'll skip that, I know you can't read this, um, but we would say basically that all the banks now are in the position that the better capitalized banks were in in 2008, where the strong banks that started out the crisis in a stronger capital position um, acted earlier to re to shore up their capital basis. And earlier isn't necessarily a, fu necessarily a function of time, it's a function of deterioration in their capital positions. So you see the better capitalized banks at the bottom of this um, acted more quickly to cut their dividends or to raise capital. And so had a much better, um, you know, started better and ended up better as well. Um, this chart doesn't include the broker dealers because they weren't required to report risk weights. So in fairness, we have done this also for broker dealers on a leverage basis. And again, you see a similar story. The firms that started out in a less levered position um, reacted earlier in the sense of sooner before there had been a lot of deterioration, whereas the more levered firms acted um, later, started off in a bad position and waited too long. Um, and the danger of this is that actually leaving Merrill Lynch aside, which is, um, I would say, different because of its acquisition by Bank of America, that the voluntary capital depletion through acquisition, share buybacks, and dividends was close to twice as high as the economic impact of losses or economic losses during the crisis. So the incentives were there to act early, but they weren't very strong. And so banks really did run down their capital positions going into a period of stress um, and sort of inflicted more damage on themselves than their economic losses actually inflicted on them. So now we're in a position of stronger capital, better incentives, and the one thing that is in the process of being added onto this is this debt shield requirement, the gone concern, gone concern loss, <laughs> gone loss of capacity, right? Everyone stumbles over it. But um, we call it the debt shield. It's the idea that the Fed is going to require um, the SIFIs and possibly the next tier of banks as well to issue a certain amount of long-term unsecured debt, uh, potentially subordinated, but uh, more likely just a senior debt, issue it from the holding company and put the owners of that debt on notice that they will be bailed in if equity is depleted. So their debt will be converted to equity in a new co. Um, and this, I think, is extremely powerful. Um, it certainly strengthens the incentives for shareholders and management to act very early because it's, it's quite clear that if this is going to be triggered, if the bail-in will be triggered, it will happen well before equity reaches zero. Some people say 4%, some people say 5.5%, some people say much higher, but it's clearly not that close to zero. And it also should strengthen the incentives for regulators, again, by giving them the confidence that they can put one firm into this resolution process and bail it in without triggering a broader systemic crisis in itself. So really getting at the core of the 08 um, difficulty. So the loss absorbing capacity is there, it's not taxpayer funds. The private sector is on notice that this is uh, potentially awaits them. And it's a very neat structure, I think. So I'm gonna back up here and say, we put all this together uh, and we looked at a measure of basically the frequency of bank failures, which we translated into sort of the mean time you can expect between bank failures. So for the, um, Less well-capitalized banks in 07, basically we thought that you could have a bank failure, failure that would wipe out equity every seven years or so, clearly much too frequently. Um, for the stronger banks then, it was about 40 years. When you add now on the stronger capital position, the incentives I talked about, and the debt shield in whatever number really you want it to be, 
uh, you go to 40, 50, 85 years between these major bank failures that wipe out equity. Um, and when you get to the debt shield, you move up into centuries. So obviously these numbers are not pinpoint precise, they're directional, but I think it makes the point that you are, um, banks will have losses, some banks will fail, but the idea of a bank that completely wipes out its equity position and potentially wipes out its uh, long-term debt as well has become considerably more remote. Um, and that th this, I think, adds to the point that, you know, further capital requirements, apart from the debt shield, may be in store, but I don't know that they add very much if you look at it in terms of economic importance. So do you want to go from 500 years to 600 years? Does that really matter? And does it matter when you weigh it against the economic constraints that such high capital levels impose? Because the effects of high capital levels on banks are being felt in terms of economic activity and are being felt in terms of lending, actually are being felt by the smaller um, borrowers, the low-income consumers, um, and the small businesses that don't have access to alternative sources of capital. So are you actually penalizing them by putting more and more capital restrictions on past this point? Um, and then I want to switch and talk about the um, the planning for a resolution because I really think that resolution is critical and activity restrictions and other restrictions aren't going to ultimately be the answer, you really need to be able to wind down a failing SIFI. So I think the Title I planning we can say has been really useful. It's helped identify a lot of structural issues in corporate structure and legal nature and these problems that Art mentioned about how business lines don't match legal or regulatory jurisdictions. And it's turned up a lot of problems. But in our mind, right. Title One, a scenario under which Title One would be invoked is not the most likely scenario for failure. And we think that a Title Two more systemic crisis is more likely. Because if you think of Title One, you need to have a loss that's considerably bigger than the CCAR losses, but that's not triggered by a market downturn. And other than fraud, it's, it's sort of hard to imagine what that might be and how it might play out. I think if it is fraud, you know, all bets are off on that firm and the point is just to liquidate it as cleanly as possible with causing as little disruption as possible. So I think Title II is really where the focus needs to be. And this is, um, apologies Art, if it's not uh, exactly what you had in mind, but this is our view of what Art described in picture form. Um, basically, your equity holders are wiped out, your debt holders become in the, debt holders from the old Hode Co become equity holders in the new holding company, the Bridge Co or the New Co. And that capital is downstream to the material operating subsidiaries who may be in the US or overseas, likely both, be banks and broker dealers. Um, and this allows those operating um, subsidiaries to continue operating in their vital economic functions and their systemic functions, it maintains systemic stability. Um, and it certainly does hold the equity holders and the management of the old firm accountable. It wipes them out completely. Maybe you want to give them warrants, maybe not, but they're, they've lost a lot of economic value. Um, and I think this also pre preserves the most value for creditors as well, because there's a lot more value in this going concern, Bridge Co., than there is in a fire sale liquidation. I don't think that we've gotten to the answer on most of them yet. Um, but stepping back again and taking this more economic perspective, I don't think that these are things that will undermine the the potential and the success of SPOE because we are moving towards a um, towards answers on all of them. And this is really, I think, the best structure that anyone has seen or talked about to maintain value, maintain systemic stability. So I think we, if you take an economic perspective, Yes, there are still questions. Yes, we'd like to see more precision um, and clarity from the FDIC on, as to how exactly they'd like SPOE to work or how they envision it to work. But this is really, to us, the way forward. Um, so I think between the, to sum up, between the capital you have now, the debt shield that's coming, and the ongoing development of the single point of entry structure or process, um, banks really are much more resilient than they were prior to the crisis. and adding further protections um, on top of those things certainly as an economic cost may not really have a benefit for either the economy or the systemic resilience of the financial sector itself um, and with that i think we can have questions <laughs>
Thank you, Sandra. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, raise quite a few good uh, lingering uh, questions. And uh, it looks like so far uh, the panel members have different views on uh, with the, on the prospect of this resolution plan, whether it would actually end too big to fail. Um, I would like to hear, uh, I wonder if Art might have some uh, response to some of the uh, questions that Dick raised, uh, just a few minutes for the panel and then we'll open to the floor uh, regarding the amount of uh, subordinated debt, convertible debt that a holding company would be required to hold. Would that be sufficient for the recapitalization? And um, also, if the single point of entry doesn't work, if it actually fails, um, what would be the broad impact to the market and how, what is the FDIC's plan to deal with that? And the other members, are, uh, should, please feel free to, uh, to add. Yeah. So, I so I think the first question goes to the amount of the long-term debt that we're looking at. Um, uh, I think you know, that's something that the Federal Reserve is trying to sort out. Um, they're working on this uh, proposal, um, and I'm sure I expect that they'll come out with a proposal at some time. I think um, if you think about the single point of entry and what you would want uh, a firm emerging from that resolution process, you would want it to be able to meet its capital requirements um, coming out of resolution. So you would expect that you would need enough debt so that the firm could could meet its uh, the capital requirements that it would face. Question whether it would need some amount on top of that to satisfy the market. Um, and uh, uh, so I think those are the kind of issues that, that will get sorted out uh, when the Fed proposes uh, uh, its regulation. In terms of single point of entry failing or not working, I'm not sure what I what's meant by that. Um, the 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 way Title II is intended to work, the way the statute is structured, uh, the, the resources that are available uh, are the resources of the estate of the failed firm. There is a liquidity facility, but again, that's limited uh, to the, to the uh, a haircut uh, estimate of the value of the assets of the firm. So uh, if the losses are uh, exceed whatever long-term debt was required, they're going to then eat into uh, the creditor class the, uh, of, of the subsidiaries. So, um, so I, I don't really know what it means for a single point of entry to fail. It's just a question of how far into the uh, into the creditor stack losses would go. So, I guess what Sandra has something to say. Yeah, I just wanted to add. I think from a market perspective, it's helpful that the new co, the bridge co, and whatever you want to call it, and the operating subsidiaries, at least the material ones, be extremely well capitalized. We sort of think of it as super capitalized because that is what will allow them to attract liquidity in the market. Um, so we would you know, think that a higher number is better in that case. So uh, regarding single point of entry, um, this, this should apply to all uh, CIFIs, right? All designated SIFIs, and I was under the understanding that in designated prudential that um, the insurance regulators had a big problem with this approach. I think in the, the FSOC uh, sort of said, well, prudential is a problem because we don't really know how it would resolve it in a single point of entry system, and of course the insurance companies are all organized as ring fence entities across all the states, and and um, sort of the, this whole single point of entry thing is sort of sort of at odds with the way insurance has been Sort of managed and 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 when uh, and when things got into trouble and and I thought this was kind of a kind of an issue there with uh, does it really apply to all all CIFIs sort of equally well or is insurance is insurance a problem here? Um, I think it's fair to say the single point of entry strategy was developed with the or is being developed with the uh, large financial holding companies in mind the way that those firms are structured. Um, question whether uh, that same strategy will apply for other forms of financial companies. And, um, you know, that's something we'll be taking a look at. I don't think we've necessarily formed a judgment on that. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to add um, something that I think is supportive of Sandra's view that I do think, although it's very important to have um, plausible resolution, 
uh, tools at hand, it's, it's much better not to have to get there. And so I think it's very important to have incentives in place for managers to recapitalize while they still can. And I do certainly agree that that was a great failure. And in fact, you know, the regulators were letting them pay out dividends and they clearly didn't have enough equity. Um, but one of the attractive ways from my point of view of doing it is to have uh, cocos that are in fact triggered by something that looks more like market values because I think a flaw underlying all of this so far is we're dealing with accounting values and what we know is that they lag true economic values whenever things are going down. It's just a system that is designed to, to basically disguise or soften declines. So if you can trigger the conversion of cocos at a relatively high level, and I think you're kind of right about where you might want to do it, um, then there will be huge incentives for a manager to uh, raise equity before. Because if you let it go to the point where the cocos convert, and if they're large enough, the shareholders will be massively diluted, and it's got to be a CEO's biggest nightmare. He has existing shareholders that hate them and new shareholders that don't want to be shareholders, and so there's no possibility they're going to survive. So I think it puts really strong incentives in the right place to, to uh, take precautionary measures. And I also think you're right that it makes it less likely that we're going to have a general banking system problem. Because if you sort of deal with them one by one as they uh, become weak, then um, the, the really hard question with SPOE, do we really have enough resources to roll it out for all eight of them at the same time, uh, I think is less likely to arise, I hope. So any questions from the floor? Yes, uh, the, um, Emery? Emery, I will go from the inside. Um, one thing I'd like to hear from the panel is how much sand can mitigation throw into these you know, beautifully designed mechanisms? I mean, you have to value some assets, transfer them, you're going to have to impose losses on um, some stakeholders, and you know, there's going to be mitigation, obviously. <coughs> What's the panel's view? Um, uh, I don't think this is a new problem. I mean, we deal with this in bank failures all the time. Um, there's uncertainty about the value of assets. We try to maximize the value of assets. There's always litig litigation involved in a resolution. I don't think that's going to be any different. Um, I think the main point about the single point of entry is that it tries to preserve value and minimize disruption by keeping uh, operations going. Um, and realizing the going concern value of the assets of the estate. We're not pricing it on day one. We don't price it at the weekend resolution necessarily. Uh, and also the Dodd-Frank Act does have some legal safeguards built into it. There is uh, that day where you can appeal to a court. I'm, yes. I'm not sure that it's going to be a very serious process, but it, it does raise some legal standard. And after that, um, they can sue the FDIC, but they can't reverse it. can't stop it. So it's they not going to keep it from happening. And that's that's the critical thing, because in a normal bankruptcy suit, well, we know what went on at Hairstock, which was the first of these things to go on. It took 50 years to resolve getting it through bankruptcy court. And liquidation was the only option. Um, if you think you're damaged after the fact, you can. it's a long process, and you can sue the FDIC and the government, and it happens all the time. But once the process goes through, and, and if it's appealed, and you have 24 hours, it's not reversible then. It, it happens. And if they make mistakes, they can be sued for it. But uh, basically, the powers are pretty airtight. Uh, hello. I, the, the academic papers and the panel is interconnected in a very interesting way, you know. Let, let, let me start with Paul. Paul clearly is, you know, is bringing up an important problem about C1 and ODSs you know, and so on. But another issue is if you look at Paul's list of, you know, ranking of the systemically risky ones, you could at the same time maybe call them as systemically beneficial too, right? Because risky return, right? So in some state of the world, they are systemically beneficial, and in some state of the world, they may be systemically risky, I mean, apart from how we measure 
so therefore, why don't we also focus on the benefits of being systemically integrated, connected, you know, firms, you know, banking, so, so, so that we don't paralyze them, you know, at the outset. And then related to that, now we come to the panel side. I hear the focus there is taxpayer losses must be prohibited. So we pass laws to that, but I don't see the discussion about why should it be the case? Why shouldn't the taxpayers pay some of the tail risk? You know, so uh, it's, you know, taxpayers pay for a lot of things, right? They pay for university research, they get benefit, they pay for infrastructure. Maybe they should pay some of the tail risk as well. So then if we take that, then the reporting is going to change. So we have to tell the taxpayers how much money they are in. So then they will maybe change the incentives. Now everything we write laws saying that our objective is zero taxpayer losses, which I think we're kidding ourselves. You know, so we should upright try to calculate how much they are in the terrorist and then report that money, and maybe calculate FDIC's loss probability, right? And then report that amount and say how much we're in, in it if that tail event occurs. But just one, one quick response. Um, it would be nice to have a lot of transparency about it, and I would feel much better about bailouts if we had an honest accounting. But what we're getting from the Treasury about the TARP program is just utter nonsense and a cover-up. But I, to me, the important figure is one that Andy Haldane computed at one point, where he calculated that the UK, continental Europe, and the US were allocating 40% of world GDP to backstopping a banking system. And any industry that is that fragile has got to be restructured in a way to make it safer. It just is, uh, I think it's an unconscionable amount to, to allocate to make something uh, safe that should have been safer to begin with. Well, no, I was just going to say, Haluk, I think it's risky for you to equate funding academic research with what we, they did for the banks. <laughs> 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 Simple point is the single entity. Does that answer? No, but Bob, um, long before there was ever mathematical risk management and all the quants and everybody in here, there were lawyers. And lawyers structured corporations to manage risk. And if you compartmentalize risk in some ways, the failure never gets to the holding company. So, I mean, the extreme one firm share of all risk, you know, it might be the easiest thing to resolve, but it might, it might make it, you know, a lot more fragile, right? I so the, I think the crisis proved that that was a false. No, I don't think, I don't. Corporate separateness didn't work because of reputational risk. But, and the institution stepped in to preserve their reputation. But, so. There are plenty, work. plenty of cases where bank holding companies survived and individual banks and part of the bank holding companies failed and got resolved. I mean, it, 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 in the past, yeah, sure, it happens. But there are other models in other parts of the world that have been pretty resilient. For example, in Spain, the two giant Spanish banks were, for, were right for the wrong reason. The Spanish regulators were terrified when they started to expand into Latin America and required that they form individual subsidiaries with individual governance and individual funding. And it turned out um, that that was the salvation of the Spanish banks during the, the crisis because they were actually able to uh, raise equity through those subsidiaries and upstream it. Uh, 
um, they would require something very different than the single point of entry because they really are operated as individual subsidiaries uh, that are joined in a different way. And so it's, we're going to have to end up with a world that has at least two kinds of models. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the multiple point of entry model seems to me like a ring-fenced world, which to some extent we're kind of creeping toward. Um, yeah. Yeah. Being one of those spicy lawyers who was involved in some of this stuff too, once in time, uh, one of the reasons we have this structure is for the separating risks into multiple. Could you speak a little louder, please? One of the reasons we have this structure is to position risk away from parts of the organization. So that when we started this with Glass Steagall, we had this for 23 and a half purposes. We put certain activities. Um, can I just add, yeah, the the idea of separating the risks so that you can protect some types of activity and some classes of market participants I think is very important from a public policy basis. And we see with some of the European banks the difficulties you get into when your holding company and your bank are the same entity. It makes it much harder to figure out how to make something like single point of entry work without actually restructuring to have a holding company if you want to protect depositors, which I think pretty much every government in the world does. Yes, um, that. Have you ever considered actually uh, thinking about contingent capital? And, you know, it may be this discussion might be generalized to think about large shocks and small shocks. And in a world where you have a large enough shock, if you have enough contingent capital to cover that shock, that may actually provide a new channel of contagion. So have you thought about that at all? Um, so so the short answer is no, not explicitly in the model. So the only thing that I, uh, we have in the model that I didn't get to talk about is that we have essentially a measure of uh, determining systemically important financial institutions as, uh, as a function of their location in the network, as their position. But uh, so the point is well taken. That's not something that I've looked at in the paper. Any more questions? Very interesting discussion today. Uh, please join me in uh, thanking the panel members and uh, give them a round of applause. <laughs> now, uh, the reception will be uh, downstairs uh, on the ground floor.